Hello everyone, my name is Jeff Meyer. I'm with Industrial Sonoma Mechanics. And we're here today to talk to Dr. Alexei Peshkovsky, Chief Science Officer and President of Industrial Sonoma Mechanics. Um, we're getting a lot of inquiries uh, around the world about uh, utilizing ISM's ultrasonic processing units for degassing. So we want to get an opportunity to talk a little bit more about that. The things we want to talk about today are what applications are degassing used for and in what industries. We're seeing a lot of interest from many different industries. And lastly, how is industrial sound and mechanics equipment utilized in the degassing application? We hope you enjoy this program. Take it away, Alexi. Hi, everyone. There are lots of situations where a liquid would have either entrained bubbles or dissolved gases that would somehow interfere with the intended purpose of the liquid. For example, if it's a coating and it has bubbles suspended in it and you apply the coating, then you will, in the end, see the bubbles in the coating after it dries. If it's an adhesive, it could be that the adhesive doesn't stick to, to, to where the adhesive is supposed to stick because you, you, you have bubbles interfering with, with the adhesion. They collect at the surface where the adhesive then doesn't have the full contact area. There could also be a situation where, for example, if it's a product that you have to fill into bottles by volume, uh, which is how many filling operations work, uh, let's say it's a beverage or maybe it's shampoo or some sort of a cosmetic product or dish soap, what have you. And if that has bubbles in it, you will not be able to fill completely. It, it will look like you fill completely, but then the bubbles eventually in the bottle will separate and you will find that you have inconsistent filling of the containers. Uh, there could also be a situation where a gas is dissolved, so you don't see it in the liquid until later. For example, in candle wax filling operations, this happens. If you have lighter fractions of shorter hydrocarbons that would normally want to gas out, uh, but uh, temporarily they're dissolved in, in wax, and you're pouring a candle. As the candle sets, there might be outgassing into the sort of into the middle of the candle, and you will form a bubble in it, and you don't even know that it's there, but until the candle gets consumed and, and you get into the bubble and then maybe the candle breaks or maybe the wick just burns off. Uh, there could also be situations where a gas needs to be removed from a liquid in order to complete a process in brewing operation. For example, you could speed up the, the, the production of wine if you remove CO2 from it or uh, in other types of uh, alcoholic beverages or or other uh, products that produce gas as a kind of a byproduct of, of the process. By removing that gas, you push the, the process forward. So there are lots and lots of different operations that require degassing, especially when mixing is an upstream process. For example, uh, two-part epoxies. You mix them together, you're going to have bubbles, and, and that interferes with their purpose two-part silicone and, and things like that. All these industries would benefit significantly if you could get rid of the bubbles or get rid of the, the gas that would later become bubbles. And uh, there is a kind of a major problem associated with uh, the current accepted method of doing it, which is vacuum. So everybody in those industries typically knows that if you have a bucket of your, let's say, two-part silicone, and you put that into a vacuum chamber and you pull vacuum on it, it will suddenly pull the gas out. It will increase the size of all the bubbles that are already there because now it's under low pressure. So they, they grow in size, their buoyancy increases and they come up as long as the liquid viscosity allows for them to, to come up and then they, they, they get out. The solubility of gases also goes down when the pressure is lower. So then you can pull dissolved gases as well as entrain bubbles out of these liquids. And so this works very well, as long as you are able to operate in small batches. Now, in industrial operations, this is a problem because you need to do it in line. The volumes are too big for vacuum chambers. It's difficult to design a vacuum chamber that would be in line. So these industries suffer from this problem and 
they can't really use simple solutions like vacuum chambers. Uh, industrial Center Mechanics offers ultrasonic processors that are very efficient at degassing, and they can degas uh, liquids in line. It could be a flow-through scenario. The efficiency is high. The process could be continuous. Our equipment can operate 24-7. And this technology also allows to not only remove and train bubbles, but also dissolve gases. Uh, the principle of ultrasonic degassing is uh, related to ultrasonic cavitation, although it's not exactly based on ultrasonic cavitation. Ultrasonic cavitation is what is typically utilized during ultrasonic processing to break up uh, particles into smaller particles, for example, break up agglomerated particles or create nanoemulsions and things like that. Uh, in ultrasonic degassing, the phenomenon of acoustic cavitation almost occurs, but not quite. So this, this, is, uh, this is how it works. I, during ultrasonic processing, there is a horn that is inserted into a liquid it could be in the batch mode or in the flow through mode, which is preferable for, for industrial situations. And the tip of this horn vibrates up and down. On the upstroke, the liquid under the horn sort of breaks up and creates vacuum voids, vacuum bubbles. Then on the downstroke, the vacuum bubbles implode and create microjets um, that can hit particles and break them into smaller particles. But if a liquid has gas dissolved in it in a sufficiently high concentration, or if you already have bubbles in the liquid, then instead of forming a vacuum bubble, you will form a, a, a gas bubble. So if uh, the gas bubble was already there, then you're simply going to vibrate this bubble kind of up and down, making it bigger and smaller. So during ultrasonic degassing, you're dealing typically with a liquid that either has bubbles already in it or has sufficiently high concentrations of gases dissolved in the liquid. So that when you try to create a vacuum bubble when the tip of the horn is on its upstroke, instead of having a vacuum bubble, you will have a bubble with gas already in it. So let's say you had entrained there. Now you're just going to have a bubble that gets bigger and smaller, sort of vibrates like this, but it cannot implode because it's full of air. And uh, there is something called secondary Bjorken's force, uh, which is an interesting phenomenon that was discovered about a century ago, that if you have two bubbles that oscillate in phase near each other, they tend to coalesce with each other. They rush toward each other and combine into a bigger bubble. And then that happens again and again and again. So entrained bubbles slam into each other during this vibration created by an ultrasonic horn and create much, much larger bubbles. They coalesce and their buoyancy increases and then they come out of the liquid. If you have dissolved gases, then in your attempt to create a vacuum bubble as the horn moves up, you instead create a, a bubble full of gas that was dissolved, but now because you've created this kind of a, a vacuum section, the vacuum area, the gas will come out into it because that's what the gases do on the vacuum. They come out of solution into the, the, the void. So it will fill that void. And it turns out that as you oscillate this bubble, now, first of all, it will not implode into nothing because now it has something in it. And it turns out that on average, as you oscillate this bubble, the surface area of the inside of the bubble is greater on the upstroke than on the downstroke. So you tend to bring more gas out of the liquid into the bubble than to take out of the bubble in, back into the liquid. It's called rectified diffusion. So very quickly, as the horn oscillates, the bubble will just kind of pull more and more and more gas into itself and become bigger. And then you're back into the, the first situation where you're going to have several bubbles like that oscillating near each other in phase. They will coalesce with each other and uh, come, out of, um, come out of the liquid. In the flow-through scenario, 
typically as the liquid flows through a reactor chamber uh, this uh, process uh, occurs very quickly so you come into the chamber with either small entrained bubbles or maybe just dissolved gases and you come out of the chamber with much much bigger bubbles so this liquid with larger bubbles could either go through a separator that sends the gas one way and the liquid uh, another way or it can just come back to the the storage tank as it recirculates and now it'll come to the top of that where the bubbles will just stay at the surface and uh, coalesce further and kind of break and just uh, leave the leave the liquid uh, completely. I hope you've enjoyed uh, that discussion from our president and chief science officer, Dr. Alexei Peshkovsky. If you have any additional questions, comments, you can either add them below or visit sonamechanics.com. Reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you about your degassing applications.